who's the GOAT, the greatest of all time? Is it Michael Jordan? Is it LeBron James? You decide. Everybody talks about the GOAT, the greatest of all time. But when we dip back into the biblical story 2,000 years ago, this idea of the greatest of all time was already established in the Roman Empire. They didn't know that yet, but Caesar Augustus was going to be the GOAT. And it was at this time that Jesus Christ was birthed onto the scene. The greatest of all time, truly. But there was a clash. There was a conflict. And the biblical writers want you to see that very clearly. And that's what we're going to be tackling in this episode. So hey, if you find this teaching to be helpful, now like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share it with someone you think could benefit. All right, let's dive in and talk about who the real GOAT is. Hi everyone, welcome to the first episode in our brand new digs. Yes, we are out of my office and I am out of the black v-neck t-shirt. Some of you are cheering right now. We are making some changes and updates to the teaching series. Well, hey, I'm really excited about this particular episode. And for those of you who have been following along, you will know that we just completed our mini series on rabbis and disciples. And so this is going to serve as a standalone teaching, and it really has two purposes. The first is the primary purpose for every teaching episode, which is to provide you something really helpful in understanding the context as it relates to the Bible. So whether you attend the Infusion Bible Conference, which I'll get to in a few moments, or you're listening to this after the fact, you have something very significant in this episode. But that second purpose is to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing this summer at the Infusion Bible Conference. So if you're not familiar with the IBC, this is a three-day event that we have put together and have done over the last several years to give you three days of a crash course in understanding the context as it relates to the Bible. And each year we choose a new subject matter. And for this summer, we're going to be tackling Paul and his Roman world. The entire New Testament is set in the Roman world. And as it specifically relates to Paul, half of the New Testament's writings are attributed to him. And sometimes Paul can be really difficult to understand, but the problem doesn't lie with Paul. The problem lies with us. We try to read his work devoid of the Roman context in which he was writing in. And so we're dedicating three days of helping you to understand what was going on in the Roman world and how does that intersect with the New Testament story primarily with Paul and his writings. And so I want to give you a snapshot of something that we're going to be tackling in the conference but to help you to better understand why understanding the Roman world is so significant to understanding the New Testament context. And we're going to focus in on Paul at the end of the episode, but I also want to bring in Mark and Luke because, again, the entire New Testament story is rooted in the Roman world. And so when it comes to the conference We want to help you to get trained in context, study the Bible better, and to accelerate your faith. And so my hope is, is that this episode will compel you to go, it is worth showing up at this conference, either in person or choosing our live stream feature, which I'll talk about at the end of the episode. But here we go. Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, he was on the throne for the first half of Jesus's life. And then you have the emperor Tiberius for the second half of Jesus's life. But what I want to do is I want to provide you with some sources around what was stated of Caesar Augustus before the birth of Jesus Christ. These were the headlines of the day. This is what was being promoted in the empire. This is what everyone knew. And buckle up because there are some very interesting parallels going on here. So let's begin with Horace. He was the main lyric poet during the time of Caesar Augustus. Notice what he writes in Odes. Thine age, O Caesar, has brought back fertile crops to the fields, has wiped away our sins and revived the ancient virtues. And the fame and the majesty of our empire were spread from the sun's bed in the west to the east 
As long as Caesar is the guardian of the state, neither civil dissension nor violence shall banish peace. This is what Horace says about Caesar Augustus, and he ends with peace. This was a very important word for the Roman Empire because it was Caesar Augustus who initiated the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And so significant to his reign was this connection of peace for the world that in roughly 9 BC, this altar called the Arapacus, the altar of peace, was constructed in Rome by Caesar Augustus promoting the fact that he has brought peace to the entire world. Now, this is what an artist's rendering looks like when it would have been in its original state, an absolutely stunning monument. Now, speaking of peace, Virgil in the Aeneid, which is arguably the most important work for the Roman world, he states this, You, O Roman, remember to rule the nations with might. This will be your genius, to impose the way of peace, to spare the conquered and crush the proud. This is what it was to be in the Roman Empire and to be in the Roman world in the first century. BC as well as AD is to impose the way of peace. Now, this is what peace did for the world as the Roman Empire spread. And what's in the yellow here is the Roman Empire into the second century AD. But Caesar Augustus was responsible for much of this in his rule and reign. Now, much of this quote unquote peace came with a sword or a cross, but nonetheless, the Romans promoted that it was Caesar Augustus who brought peace to the world. Now, Virgil, also in the Aeneid, speaking of Caesar Augustus, writes this, Lo, under his auspices, my son, that glorious Rome shall bound her empire by earth and her pride by heaven. This, this is he whom thou so oft hearest promise to thee, Augustus Caesar, son of a god, who again set up the golden age. Caesar was proclaimed to be a son of God. Now, let me show you one more source, and this one was found in Western Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey, in what was known in the first century as the Roman province of Asia. And you're going to notice most of these cities because these are the cities of the seven letters of the churches in Revelation. Just south of Ephesus is a site called Priene. And at the ruins of Priene, there is an agora, a marketplace, and at the north end, there are all of these shops. And in one of these shops was found an inscription that is more commonly known as the Priene calendar inscription, but its actual title is this Ogus II number 458. It was composed in roughly 9 BC, so several years before Jesus was born. And notice what this inscription states about Caesar Augustus that was being promoted throughout the entire Roman world. Since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue, that he might benefit humankind, all people here sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God Augustus was the, get this, the beginning of, of the gospel. It means good news. It's the word euangelion, the same word that is used in the New Testament. That since the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the gospel for the world. Welcome to the headlines of who Caesar was before Jesus was born. Yep, Caesar Augustus was proclaimed as the divine son of God, who had a gospel, an euangelion of good news, of peace and prosperity for all of humanity, the salvation of, for humanity, and according to Horace, with forgiveness of sins, however they understood that. 
Now, some of you, this is your first time hearing this and you're rattled right now. You feel the tension because you go, everything that we hold near and dear about Jesus Christ was already in existence being said about Caesar Augustus. What in the world do you do with that? Well, we come to the text as informed readers. Like this language is familiar to us because we know it in connection to Jesus Christ. And so it's odd to us that it was said about Caesar. It's actually flipped in the Roman world because everybody proclaimed this about Caesar. And then now it being stated about Jesus brought a contrast. It brought a conflict. It brought a Jesus versus Caesar understanding. And for those of you who feel that tension, you go, but this is sacred and holy in connection to Jesus. Here's what I absolutely love about this, is that the very usage of the same titles for Caesar being used in connection with Jesus causes you to pause and go, okay, somebody is and somebody isn't. Either see this is true of Caesar or this is true of Jesus. It can't be true of both because the language is the same. And what's more, Caesar represented a kingdom. Jesus represented a kingdom. They were very different kingdoms. And the fact that the language was shared between Caesar and Jesus tells us that it's either one kingdom is right and the other kingdom is wrong. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have Caesar's kingdom and you can't have Jesus's kingdom because they're in direct conflict with one another. You got to choose which one are you going to be part of. And so that tension you feel in understanding this is the tension that the gospel writers, when they're composing this, would have recognized in their audience upon receiving the words that they were writing. And so even when it comes to this pre a calendar inscription where it's talking about how Augustus is the son of God and it's the beginning of the gospel, the good news for the entire world, Mark does this in Mark 1 in connection to Caesar Augustus, which this is said of Caesar. And Mark begins his gospel and he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's all he has to include and everybody knows, oh my goodness, everything that is forthcoming is going to be in tension between what is being said about Jesus and what is being said about Caesar and the Roman Empire. And everybody would have caught this reference because that's all Mark has to do. Now, Mark did this. Luke did this as well. Luke recording the birth narrative of Jesus in Luke 2 says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. He just says Caesar Augustus. He doesn't define anything. He doesn't give us any more information. Why? Because Luke understood that his audience knew everything about Caesar Augustus, how he came to the throne, how the Republic moved into an empire, and what was going on in the Roman world being pronounced about Caesar. And so when he includes these details, they're all true, but everybody would have seen the contrast. So notice what the angel says to the shepherds. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. There's our word, uangelion, that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. Yes, for the Jews, this is great news, but he is also the Lord. That was what was stated of Caesar. He was Savior. He was Lord. Everybody knew that. And yet the pronouncement of the angel to the shepherds is, oh, there's a new gospel that is in town. There is a new Lord on the scene, and it is Jesus Christ, the true Son of God. Who, by the way, a few verses later we find out that the angels proclaim glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace, of course. Rome has their peace. Jesus has their peace. And they're very, very different. Now, that's how Mark does it. That's how Luke does it. But I mentioned to you at the beginning of this episode, we're going to be focusing in on Paul at the Infusion Bible Conference. And so let me give you a couple examples from Paul. And it begins with this understanding that, yes, all of this was said about Caesar Augustus and it would pass on to Tiberius and then for the emperors that came afterwards, that everything that Paul was doing was demonstrating, listen, it is Jesus versus Caesar. And there was a prophecy 
from the Hebrew scriptures that I believe Paul was drawing upon in Galatians 4.4 when he writes, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. That Jesus came into the world while Caesar Augustus, the most significant emperor in Roman history, when he was at the height of his power, that's when God sent Jesus into the world. And this was not a shocker if you understand the Hebrew scriptures. So most notably in Daniel chapter 2 in verse 44, there is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar receives and Daniel interprets the dream and it talks about how four kingdoms beginning with Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is going to unfold and then when that fourth kingdom, which we understand to be Rome, is on the scene, it states this, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Rome is on the world stage. And Paul goes, yep, and God has been orchestrating all of these events for this moment for Jesus to enter on to the scene. And now God's everlasting kingdom is going to be established in and through Jesus Christ. And it's going to come at a contrast to the kingdom of Rome. And so Paul, throughout his letters, is demonstrating this conflict and this reality. Um, One of the places that you see this is in his letter to the Romans. Of course, he's writing to Rome. Of course, he's going to establish the foundation between Caesar and Jesus in his opening verses. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, not the gospel of Rome, the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul goes, let's just get it out there. This is who Jesus is. Now let's address the implications for all of you living in Rome and for who would get the letter that was written to the Romans. And there's one other place that I just want to show you. I want to do it by giving you... um, a host of all of these titles that were used of the Caesars. And so when you go into more Roman literature, you see Caesar was called the bringer of peace, the savior of the world, son of God, Lord, head of the body of the world, salvation through Caesar alone, supreme one, the firstborn image of the gods. All of this was said of Caesar. And so for this last reference, I just want to give you in this episode, and this one again in connection to Paul, is not a letter written to Rome, but it was a letter written to the Colossians, but it was within, again, the Roman Empire. And one of the most powerful things ever composed about Jesus, I want you to hear anew in light of what you have learned in the midst of this episode and with these titles that you see up here on the screen right now. It's Colossians 1, verses 15 and following. Paul writes this about Jesus. He says, Now the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. It's one of the most powerful things ever stated about Jesus. But when you hear that, in light of the Roman context in which it was written into, you begin to get, you know, the the goose pimples. You start to realize, oh my goodness, this is electric in connection to what was already being said about Caesar and who Jesus Christ was in the midst of these dueling narratives. And what's more, how did Jesus bring about his peace in the world? By dying on a cross, the symbol of Roman victory and might. Friends, welcome to the tension of the New Testament. Welcome to the tension of Jesus versus Caesar. 
And what's so helpful is that when you get eyes to see all of the ways in which Mark and Luke, and specifically Paul, is addressing this contrast, you are able to see what Paul is saying with greater clarity and understanding. Because there was a narrative of the Roman Empire that has come forward 2,000 years. It's the narrative of our world as well. And it says this is how things are supposed to function. This is who is important. This is what you do. This is how you serve yourself. This is what life is all about. And there's a narrative that was introduced 2,000 years ago about Jesus who says, actually, the kingdom that I inhabit, that I lead, that I rule, that I'm inviting you to be part of is very different than the kingdom of the world. It's often stated that Jesus' kingdom is an upside-down kingdom because everything the world values is flipped on its head in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And when you understand what is going on in the Roman world and how the New Testament writers are writing the, the way of Jesus and how it's conflicting, you have better eyes to see how to live more faithfully to the kingdom of Jesus Christ than to the kingdom of Caesar, which moves forward as our kingdoms of our world. And so friends, my hope for you today is that what we have looked at will just give you a sense of, ah, oh, that's so helpful to know as you dive back into the New Testament readings. But also I hope it compels you to consider joining us on June 14 to 16 for the Infusion Bible Conference in Franklin, Tennessee. We have a live stream option for those of you who can't make it. We have an in-person gathering that will be socially distanced and all the rules and regulations that are in place for Tennessee will be true at Church of the City where it's being hosted as well. But we have been working on this content now because it was postponed last year due to COVID for two years. We have over 40 presentations on all the ways in which the Roman Empire intersects with the New Testament story. And what we just did in this episode was just one such topic. And so we're gonna be tackling so many different things. It's gonna help you to read the New Testament differently, to see things you've never seen before. It's gonna be an amazing event. And I'd love to invite you to check out infusionbibleconference.com. The early bird discount ends on April 9th, so the clock is ticking. Get there, check out who's going to be presenting, what we're going to be talking about, and love to invite you to register for this amazing event. Now, friends, as always, our hope is, is that everything we do helps you to grow in your relationship with God by understanding the Bible in its original context so that you can learn, love, and live it out every day. So thanks for joining us for an episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life. 